Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Today I want to share something that I see or have heard in many circles of the Christian faith being spoken about and shared in different platforms, uh, touching the mind of prayer, you know, fervent prayer, touching the mind of what do we do to pray and have results, to pray and have answers. How do we have answers? How do we have results? I know at one point perhaps in your life you have woken up to a sudden danger, to a sudden testation, to something heavy, to a sudden threat, uh, to something so bigger than you that it almost makes your stomach run. And that's part of humanity. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Bible says, but the Lord does deliver them from all of them. And so what if you woke up one day and you were in trouble, some sort of trouble, and you needed to pray through that trouble? Because many believers do not know how to pray through issues. They do not know how to pray through circumstances. Uh, they do not know how to pray through danger, you know. And so you wake up one day, one evil day, and uh, you hear the worst news possible in your ears. What do you do? How do you pray? And of course, like they say, that the only way you can test a man is to see that man under pressure. When a man is under pressure, there's a lot of things that they can do. There's a lot of things that they would do because they're under pressure. And even right now as I'm speaking, the world is under a sort of pressure. The world is under a sort of panic. The world is under a sort of threat. The world is under a sort of insecurity. People are isolating and on lockdown nations. It is just a lot of destruction in the atmosphere, physically and spiritually. We know that the powers, you know, the spirit realm have sent a plague in the world, you know, and to that notice and understanding, people don't know what to do. People don't know where to go. People don't know what's their next step. You know, some people's businesses are crumbling and they don't know what to do. Economies are frustrated. And they don't know what to do, you know. Some are having their own sick in intensive care units and they're gasping for breath. They don't know what to do. But there's somebody right now probably don't even have disease or have not seen disease in your area. But you can perhaps connect to an experience, a life, a story in your past where you have woken up to something that has threatened you, that has, you know, provoked you to a space of needing to pray and divine intervention so desperately, to an emergency you know, or to something that has stood for a time and you see it's leading to your destruction. And when I'm talking about destruction, I'm not just talking about financial. It could be life destruction. It could be family destruction. You know, it could be the health of your child. It could be career that is going down the drain, whatever it is, you know. We need to know how to produce results. We need to know how to produce answers. We need to know how to pray through something and get the desired answer. The Bible says that all things are possible to him that believes. All things are possible to him that believes. All. I mean all. God has let that slide out there for every believer to tell them all things are possible to him that believes. Okay, so there is no limitation to a believer. There is no threat to a believer bigger than God. There is no testation bigger for a believer. But we need to know how to go through the things that we go through. One of the most misunderstood scriptures that I've seen is Romans 8, uh, 28. Many people read that scripture and they say, and we know, they say, that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purposes. People always read that scripture. We have had people quote Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord or love God and are called according to his purposes. All things work together for good. And that's one of the scriptures in the Bible that has been grossly abused, misinterpreted, misrepresented, and preached wrongly 
and indifferent seed has been planted in the hearts of believers touching that scripture because many people do not understand what Romans 8.28 means. And tonight, I feel God is taking me around and provoking my spirit to touch that area for you to understand that scripture the way it is supposed to be understood because remember the bible says my people perish for a lack of knowledge but sometimes a lack of knowledge is not an unavailability of information sometimes information is available and we assume that because biblical information is available therefore that turns to knowledge and revelation there's many things that are preached and spoken on our pulpits on our altars that yes are informing men about the bible but to inform men about the bible and to reveal christ in scripture those are two different things there are people out there who yes are teaching and are being taught but they don't seem to have the results okay of the things that they teach the bible says that a little living spoils the whole door a little living he says spoils the whole door it takes a little small revelation in fact the amplified of galatians 5 9 it speaks of how a little living a slight inclination to error or a few false teachers leaving the whole lamp and he says, and it perverts the whole conception of faith or misleads the whole church. If I teach you something that is off, that inclines slightly off, that just goes slightly off the teaching of the faith, it means it can distort your whole revelation and understanding of faith. It can destroy and mislead our whole church and our whole ministry. Some ministries are destroyed because of one thing mis interpretation of scripture the ministry that are destroyed because of one simple error of the word there are individuals right now that are in the grave because they have been misinformed about the word I know a story of a young girl who had a dream a years ago this story was told me by a sister of this young girl and I had an opportunity to meet the lady a few weeks I think before she passed this young lady uh, one time has a dream and in a dream she's putting on a gown and in putting on a gown the man she's supposed to marry in the dream does not appear and so her dream ends when she's waiting for the man to appear and that man does not appear millions of women have had those kinds of dreams across the world before now and tomorrow somebody will have that kind of dream and then she goes to a pastor and shares that kind of dream and when she shares that kind of dream the pastor tells this lady God says, prepare yourself, you're going to die in three years. What happened? She believed it. She inclined to what the word of the man of God, quote in quotes, said to her. And I meet this lady, and the sister tells me that from the time that was told her, she went back home and told her family that my pastor has said that I should prepare for death in three years from now. And indeed, after one year, she got an aggressive cancer. I meet her in the third year of what the minister in court had told her and she was in her last days of death and they called me to pray for her but in praying for this lady my spirit felt that she would not heal because her heart had made up and accepted to die who and how was this woman's life changed into death in three years because a man by error spoke a word to this woman's life that inclined her spirit to error and that falsification destroyed her life that falsehood destroyed her life that is why paul tells timothy forget not from whom you have learned those things it's important for you to understand who teaches you and who should not teach you because believers think that everybody who opens the bible is preaching the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and many people are getting destroyed in the process so I said sometimes the lack of knowledge is not necessarily the unavailability of information sometimes information is available biblical information is available but is that turned into revelation if it is not revelation then it could destroy that's why he says in Galatians 5 9 he says that a little living a slight inclination the amplified version says to error or a few false teachers the Bible says living the whole lump it perverts the whole conception of faith that means even your faith can be perverted because somebody has inclined to error through wrong teaching wrong teaching people ask themselves why don't we see power in the body of Christ in the church like we used to see it in the book of Acts it's a good question it's a founded question for you as an individual 
But I want you to understand that there are people on the same surface of the earth that are seeing those results, those answers, as it was in the book of Acts. We see the lame walk in our ministry. We see the blind see in our ministry. We see the deaf hear in our ministry. We see the dumb speak in our ministry. We see cancer leave in our ministry. We've seen limbs grow in our ministry. We've seen HIV. Recently, I got a case of a child who was born with HIV in the Gulu Crusade. Let's check this kid for weeks. The kid is okay. No HIV in the body. So because you have not seen that, it doesn't mean that they are not exist. And we have believers out there who, you know, uh, dismiss. And they say, oh, no, there's no miracle working power of God anymore. Oh, the signs and wonders and miracles that happened are for people of old in the book of Acts. They're not for the church and for this hour now. No, no. Miracles are still available now as they were thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago. The power of God is still available now as it was hundreds and thousands of years ago. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He works then, works now, and will work tomorrow. The power of God, the anointing of the Spirit of God is still available. What has happened is that over the years, the gospel has been convoluted, and doctrines and ideas of men have been crept in unawares into the church by men which are crafty. And these doctrines coming into the body of Christ every other day have killed and destroyed the power of God and the effect of the word because the word preached today in some ministries, if I may say, are traditions of men, are ideas of men, are doctrines of men. You know, some go to Bible school, which is good to go, theology school, which is good to go. But which theology school are you going to? Which Bible school are you going to? Hallelujah. And so I'm not in any way seeking to attack you know, I'm seeking by the word of God to heal and show people that more than ever before in this hour, we need the word of God to come out in its clarity and truth like it's supposed to come out. When men know the truth, the truth will set us free. I go back to Romans 8, 28. He says, people say, oh, we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. And I said, this scripture has been wrongly taught and misrepresented and some are dying and are losing a lot and accepting losses they're not supposed to accept because all things are working together for good. Some people are dying and they're saying, ah, all things work together for good. Some businesses are dying, yeah, all things work together for good. Marriages are failing, ah, all things work together for good. Children are losing their way in households, ah, all things work together for good. Men are losing their jobs. Ah, all things work together for good. And so we have used that scripture to give an excuse of the inefficiency of the power of God through his word in saying that all things are working together for good. It's okay if when you say that, later things change for you and become better. But not all who have quoted that scripture, Romans 8.28, things have become better. In fact, some have come from worse to worse to worse until they die or lose everything, and they still claim Romans 8, 28. There are people who say, oh, all things are working together for good because they have received the divine instruction by the Spirit that they sound bigger and better. But there are those who say that statement passively, in ignorance, in hopelessness, in unbelief, okay, in denial as a defense mechanism in their subconscious mind and conscious ideas to give excuse for the inefficiency of the word of God and the power that must come with that. And that is why I want to touch that portion of scripture and help us understand this. Help us understand this. Now, allow me to help explain that firstly, Romans 8.28 has verses and scriptures before. And we cannot now say, oh, let us only get that and get it out of the context of what God was trying to say in the way he was trying to say it. You need to go back a few scriptures before and understand exactly how Romans 8.28 should work for you as a believer. How all things work together for good for them that love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. You need to go about. When you go before them, He's bringing a conversation touching the person of the Holy Spirit. And we shall begin from verses 26. He says, in the Amplified Version, he says, Likewise, or so too, the Holy Spirit comes to our aid, he says, and bears us up 
in our weakness. He helps us in our infirmities. Okay? For we do not know what to pray or what prayer to offer, nor how to offer it worthily as we ought. But the Spirit, the Bible says, himself goes to meet our supplication and pleads in our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for utterance. Okay? The King James says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmity. The Holy Spirit helpeth our infirmity. For we know not what we should pray as we ought to pray, he says, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Verse 27 says, And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Number one. When we're talking about praying in the Spirit, or praying with the Spirit, we're talking about the perfect way to pray. Why? Because the Bible says, the Spirit that maketh intercession for the saints, maketh that intercession according to the will of God. So the Bible is clear that if we pray according to His will, He heareth us. The only reason a man would not be heard by God is if that man prays, against the will of God, okay? But in John 5, 14, it says, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything, anything, if we ask anything according to his will, the Bible says, he hears us. And if we know, the Bible says, that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, the Bible says, we know that we have the petition that we desire of him. We know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. In other words, if you pray according to the will of God, he will hear you. And if you know that he hears you, then whatsoever you have petitioned, whatsoever you have asked, whatsoever you have desired, the Bible says, you shall have it. And God is telling us here that one of the most underlying definitions of praying according to my will is praying through the Spirit. That is what he's saying. He says, for the Spirit that maketh intercession knows the mind of God. Okay? He knows our hearts as well. And because of that, that person of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And that portion of Scripture also is misunderstood grossly. Okay? Because when men read that the Holy Spirit prays for us, do you know what many think? They say, huh, so if the Holy Spirit prays for me, so what's the point of me praying? What's the essence of me praying? What's the point of me praying if the Holy Spirit is praying for me? If the Holy Spirit liveth to make intercession for me, what is this me of praying? Or why don't I have results if the Spirit is interceding for me according to the will of God? Why don't I see answers as a Christian? So we have those two. So I was saying, why don't I see the results, okay, that are supposed to come with the Spirit of God that intercedes for me according to the will of the Father? Oh, but again, some also say, oh, why then do I pray? if the Holy Spirit is interceding for me? Or then why, if I'm praying, why do I need, okay, to pray and make supplications and petitions in the absence of the Holy Spirit? Or then what's the essence of my intercession and the intercession of the Spirit? Why are both of us praying? Why doesn't one of us pray? Because one of us knows how to pray and he prays better. No, go back to Scripture. Okay? The Bible did not say that the Holy Spirit prays for you only to sit back. The Holy Spirit has not been called to do what God has called us to do. Okay? God has not ordained the person of the Holy Spirit to do for us what he has instructed us to do. Or to be passive in the understanding that the Holy Spirit is helping. There are many believers who don't even pray. Oh, the Holy Spirit is praying. He's in the city. And as strange as that might be, there are people who think that way, or who read that scripture and are taught that way, or interpret it that way. But let's go back to the root and go deeply to understand exactly what God is telling us. Now, the word translated as helpeth, when we go back, uh, the KJV, when it says, and likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. The Greek word there is sunantilambanomahi. It's translated as the Holy Spirit lays hold along with us. He takes hold opposite together with us. 
he takes hold opposite together with us. For example, if you have a table in a room, a big table in a room, and you need it to be carried and you cannot carry it alone, and then you go on one side of that table to hold it, okay? And then you call somebody and tell them, you know, come and help me hold the other side of the table. That's what Isunante Lambonomahi is. That's what the helping in Romans 8.26 is. He helps you opposite together with. In some translations, it's also the word to cooperate with, to cooperate. He doesn't suppress your operation. He comes to cooperate with your endeavors. He comes to help you in obtaining. So he's not saying that the Christian should be passive. No, he's saying that when we're talking about the spirit of prayer, supplication, sometimes we do not know how to pray as we ought to pray, okay? But the spirit of God helps us. He helps in our weakness. He helps in our inefficiency. The word there for infirmities is inability to produce results. He helps us in our inability to produce results. So we can produce the results that the scriptures, the word of God professors to have. And so God has not called the Holy Spirit to do your work. No, God has called the Holy Spirit to help you do your work. Okay, to help you do your work. And, and if you're following me here, I'm trying to define fervent prayer. I'm trying to define prayer that has results. I'm trying to help a believer have result-oriented prayers. When we do open grounds and stadiums for crusades, many a time I have learned to pray through the Spirit. Okay? But I have learned to pray in this particular understanding that he is helping me obtain particular results. And so when I see the miracles happen, I know why those miracles are happening. Because the Spirit helps us. He helps us. He helps us. He helps us. Okay? He helps us. Because we don't know how. He helps us. Okay? God, like I said, doesn't want the Holy Spirit to do this work alone. When somebody says, Holy Spirit, take over, don't think that God is saying just be passive. No. There is an operation of your declaration. There is an operation of your faith as well. There's an operation of your act, okay? Because it's the only way this equation can be completed. Amen. I will read for you in John chapter 14, verse 16. When Jesus is talking about the Father, the essence of the Holy Spirit, he says, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you. He may give you, or he will give you, he shall give you another comforter. Again, the word there is parakletos, which means one which is called alongside to help. He's not saying that you do nothing. No, he sends one alongside to help. You have to do something. You have to pray. Okay? You have to pray. You have to learn to pray. But the Spirit of God is sent alongside you. Okay? The Bible says in the book of Acts 1 verses 8, it says, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And he says, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. He says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Okay? And when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, he did not say the Holy Ghost shall be witness for you. Uh-uh. The work still goes up to you as a believer. He says, ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem. So the essence of the pattern of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer is to confirm the affirmed, not to affirm for your confirmation. No. The essence of the person of the Holy Spirit is to come alongside to help you as you witness. But you are the one that witnesses. To help you come alongside with you on the opposite side to carry for you in your life of prayer. But you are the one praying. God is telling Christians here, you cannot have an effective life without a life of prayer. No man produces a certain kind of result in the gospel without a life of prayer. You can tell the results of men by how they pray. You can tell a man who prays. You can tell a man who prays. It doesn't matter how the world defines prayer. Some people define prayer as screaming, oh, and shouting, and making a public spectacle of it all, and drying their lips, and the Bible says, uh, appearing before men to be fasting and praying. Okay? They do not know how to deal with the God of the secret things. They don't understand how to do the things in secret. And yet the Bible says, and the God which sees you, the Father which sees you in secret, the Bible says, shall reward thee openly. I always tell people, there is no open reward 
of God without a secret experience with God. And that's our life of prayer. But some of us, even our secret places, are places with ignorance. And we think we can have results with God, yet our secret places with God are ignorant. They are ignorant. They don't have the results and power that they're supposed to have. Okay? And that's the essence of why we teach what we teach, how we teach it. Okay? And so I'm taking you step by step so you follow me, so you understand how to have results in your life of prayer. How to understand fervency in prayer. Okay? How to understand it. How to connect to it. Okay? If the world knows this, COVID-19, the virus that is frustrating the present hour, will be no more. It will be no more. It will be no more. Disease would be no more. Life would be easy for people who believe. All things would be possible for all who believe. Now, he said that you shall be my witnesses. That means it's your work to be his witness. But back to what I was teaching. He says that the Spirit helpeth in our infirmity. For we know not what we should pray. Okay? For as we ought. He says, but the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us, the Bible says, with groanings which cannot be uttered. Let's define these groanings. Let's define these groanings which cannot be uttered. Okay, if the Spirit is interceding in groanings which cannot be uttered, it means he's doing his own work there. Okay, and I'm here and I'm waiting on him. Then how am I supposed to react to that as a believer? Now, when people speak of groanings which cannot be uttered, Okay? Some people think then that it implies that the Holy Spirit is deficient of language. No, 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 no. The Holy Spirit cannot be deficient of language because the Holy Spirit is the person of God. God is the author of language, both physical and spiritual, and perhaps animal language if they exist because animals communicate with belief. He's the author of anything, you know, to be language. So when the Bible says with intercessions for us with groanings that cannot be uttered, some people think, oh, the Holy Spirit is deficient of language. No, 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 no. He cannot be deficient of language. That only is in the realm of speech, okay? That sometimes the things that happen in the spirit realm, they might not be an articulate speech for them in the physical realm. There might not be an articulate speech for the things that happen in the spirit, in the physical realm. There might not be a phrasing and pronunciation of speech for the things that happen in the physical. And so when Paul is talking about the groanings which cannot be uttered, he's talking about the space where some of these things are hard to be articulated or phrased in the physical realm. That does not mean that the Spirit of God is deficient of spiritual language in prayer. Or else, how then would he pray to God? How can the Spirit of God lack language? Okay? But to understand this groaning, we need to again go back in the verses before. Okay? I think I'll probably take us back in verses 20. He says, For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. And the next verse says, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. He's telling us of the hope, okay, the hope of that deliverance. For we know, he says, verses 22, that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And verses 23 also, and not only they, creation, but also ourselves which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we, he says, ourselves grown within ourselves waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. There's a consciousness of creation that is groaning, okay, to be delivered from the bondage of the curse that befalls the fallen nature and the fallen world. And likewise, we, which are the first fruits of the Spirit, we too carry that groaning of adoption, which is the redemption of our bodies from terrestrial to celestial. There's an inward groaning. But where does that groaning come from? It's not innately produced in us by our own wisdom and ability. It's not innately produced in creation in its own wisdom and ability. That groaning in creation and in the first fruits of the Spirit, which are born again believers, you and I, all begins from the heart of God that daily groans for the deliverance of creation from bondage of the fallen world 
and as well as you as a believer from that deliverance by the redemption of your body. That which is in man groaning and in creation groaning is predominantly what was groaning in God before. It's what has always been in the heart of God. And that's the essence of expressing his love through sending the person of Jesus Christ. That we might not perish but have eternal life. But he's saying that this salvation, this redemption, is not only for the redemption of humankind, but everything that is in the world, everything that is subject to bondage against itself because of the fallen world and what Satan and his cohorts have done on the earth. Okay? Originally, disease never existed on the earth. All things created by God were good and were for the good of man. All things created by God were for the good of man. Everything he created, he said, he created for good. In Isaiah, the Bible says he has not formed the earth and established it in vain. He formed it to be habited. Okay? He formed everything in the world to be relatable and connected in advantage to mankind. Everything he created in Genesis, he already said, and it was good. So how do we have disease? Okay? How do we have creatures against man? That is why later when he's talking about the prophetic line of the restoration of the world and the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he speaks of a time where the lion will eat straw again. Because lions were not meant to eat meat, to eat human beings. Okay? That is something that went out of the order because of the fall of man and whatever comes with that. Viruses were not meant to kill men. Bacteria were not created to kill men. Cells were not made to turn against man. God did not create air to carry disease for man. But all of this happened because of the fall. All of this happened because man failed. Okay? So now, when we speak of salvation, new creation, when you become regenerated, it says, if any man be in Christ, <laughs> he is a new creation. And he says, and behold, the old things are past. Behold, all things are become new. And the next verse says, and all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. He has reconciled us back to Christ. And as ministers then, we are telling all men, to come into this fellowship of reconciliation that makes you one with God. Because when you are a new creation, all things are become new. And all things are of God. That means when you are a new creation, nothing is supposed to set itself against the course and order of your life. Or if it is against the course and order of men, you are more than a natural man. You are a new creation. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. This is the heritage of the servants of God and their righteousness is of me. You have the likenesses of God in you now. And because God is in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory, greater is he which is in us than he that is in the world. It means nothing in the world when you are a new creation is supposed to shock, shake, threaten, manipulate, intimidate you into fear. You're bigger than it. You're bigger than it. If people knew this, if people understood this, they would not carry the fear that you across the world. Let the world fear because they don't have Jesus. But you are a believer. <laughs> do not be shaken and afraid for anything. Please do be anxious about nothing. Be careful for nothing. That's the essence of the word of God. That's why he tells us the things that he tells us. That's why he sent his word to us. Okay? And so, that spirit of God utters, implies things, not deficiencies of language, but things that cannot be articulated or phrased into human language to be spoken. And because of that, okay, if you, God says that the spirit of God is helping you on the other opposite end, he is the one sent to help alongside. If you are praying, but the spirit that is praying through you carries no articulation, or human phrase, yet he is groaning by the Spirit. What happens? That's why when you open your mouth, you speak a language that cannot be understood by men. That's why we speak in tongues. 
When a man opens his mouth, he says, Araba, kosha, taka, tala, paye. Those are groanings, but they carry no articulation. They carry no pronunciation in human language. They carry no phrase of understanding in human language. But when you are praying in the spirit, okay, because he's helping you, he's not doing it for you. Like some people have interpreted that scripture to say, he's doing it alongside with you. He's cooperating. He's opposite of the other end. When the end of him is groaning in words that carry no articulation and phrase by speech, yet the language is distinctive, complete, and perfect. That's why he prays in line with the will of God, because he is, the Spirit of God is one with God, and he cannot be inferior with language. But the things that he prays, that human language has no articulation or phrase or verb or pronunciation for. And then what happens? You find yourself speaking in tongues. For he says, for he that prays in tongues speaks mysteries and do God. He says, for men understand him not. How be it? He speaks mysteries. He speaks mysteries. Okay? He builds as himself up. You build, you defy yourself. Why? Because even though you're speaking in a language men cannot understand, the Spirit of God is connected. He's the one, remember, the Bible says, that give us utterance. In the book of Acts, the Bible says they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the Spirit doesn't give us speech because it doesn't have the speech for some of the things that happen. The human language is inferior and it's not enough to articulate spiritual language. But what the Spirit of God will give you is utterance, is to speak in tongues. Okay? So I tell people, when trouble comes, when circumstances come, when you're in trouble of anything, when things are shaking you, when you don't know what to do, okay, lock yourself up in a room and start to intercede by the Spirit. That's why I feel sorry for people who say, oh, in this day, tongues are not there. You're not supposed to speak in tongues. Or tongues are for long ago. All that are speaking in tongues are useless. Let me tell you. Tell me a man who is against tongues or the speaking of tongues, and I'll tell you a man who has never gotten a man out of a wheelchair. And I'll tell you a man who has never raised a dead body. And I'll tell you of a man in whose meetings a blind eye has never opened, or a deaf ear heard, or a tumor fallen off a man. Tell me one man, a minister, who is against the speaking in tongues. And I'll tell you a minister whose ministry is full of talk and without power. How then can you effectually establish the will of God on the earth without the aid of the person of the Holy Spirit? And then how can the Spirit give utterance and something is not coming out of a man's mouth okay that's why we speak in tongues and it says he that speaketh in tongues speaketh mischief albeit the bible says he is not understood by men but he is not understood by god that's why i tell every believer you should and must believe god to be able to pray in the spirit and the evidence of it was speaking in tongues in the book of Acts for the first experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so shall it always be. There is no other way. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, again, let's go back to Romans 26 through 28. Okay? So you now connect this. Let's read the Amplified Version. He says, So too, the Holy Spirit comes to our aid and bears up in our weakness, for we do not know what prayer to offer or how to offer it worthily as we owe. But the Spirit himself goes to meet our supplication and pleads in our behalf, of course, alongside with us, with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for utterance. Okay? And he who searches the heart of men, he says, knows what is in the mind of the Holy Spirit what his intent is. Now remember, I told us, when he says help us, our inability to produce results, he's alongside with us. He's holding the opposite end and cooperating, but our level of prayer still takes precedence before God. And he says, because the Spirit intercedes and pleads before God in behalf of the saints according to and in harmony with God's will, listen, we are assured, now let's go to 28, and know that God being a partner in their labor, who are there, who are there, when he says there, okay, there, never, who, the saints, all things work together and are fitting into a plan for good for those who love God and are called according to his design and purposes. There it is. He's saying we are assured and know that God being a partner in their labor, which labor there is, 
The labor there is the prayers of believers, the fervent prayers of believers. The labor right there is the believer praying. So when you say Rapa Tala Baka, the Spirit of God is helping you. He helps you. And God tells us now because of that we are assured and know that God being a partner in their labor. How is God partnering in our labor of prayer? Through the ministration of the Holy Spirit. Through the intercession of the Holy Spirit. He says all things work together and are fitting into a plan for good to those who love God and are called according to his design and purpose. Romans 8, 28 was for praying men. It was for praying men. It was for men who pray. The Bible says in James 5, 16 that the honest, heartfelt, continued prayer, he says, of a righteous man makes tremendous power available and he says and that power he says is dynamic in nature what does it mean when he says the power is dynamic in nature you know you can speak in tongues for healing but as you're speaking in tongues for healing your finances as well are changed you can speak in tongues for your finances and as you're doing that god realizes you need protection from a thief outside your boundaries and then he confuses the mind of the man that is planning to break through your house. Because when the power is available, it becomes dynamic in nature. Wow. So Romans 8.28 is not for men who are accepting loss. <laughs> Romans 8.28 is not for men who are accepting defeat. Romans 8.28 is not for men who are weak. Romans 8.28 is for men who have learned to pray. And that is why I tell believers, you must learn how to pray through something. Before I go for meetings, I pray through them. And then I hear that affirmation in my spirit that all is well. I'll be with you. I'm going to use you. It's going to work. And that's how we have the results we have. That's how we have the results we have. When power is available, there is a lot that can happen. There's a lot that we can do. As I said, the world right now is frustrated, doesn't know what to do with COVID, coronavirus. But we know. <laughs> we know what to do. We know what to do. No believer should die of corona. No, 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 no. But even more than that now, a believer can help the world heal because God has given us the answer. He has given us the solution. I want somebody right now I don't know what is happening. It might not be a virus. It might be any other disease. It might be uh, something troubling your house. It might be frustration at your work. The bank, you know, is on your case. The loans are killing you. They're going to hang you. I want to pray with you. There's a minister right now at odds worried about what's going to happen for them in this hour. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. Father, in the name of Jesus. Speak in tongues right now, pray in the spirit. Rosa kala I feel a miracle is happening right now. I feel something is happening for somebody. Wherever you are, pray in the spirit. Knowing very well that the spirit helps us. He's helping in our inability to produce results. Because we must produce results. That's why he said the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for the spirit that you sent to aid us. And that all promises in you are yea and amen to the glory of the Father. It is done in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have made that prayer with me, it's answered. Believe God that all things are working together for your good because you are called you're designed and purposed for him and by him 
And if you're there right now, and you're watching this set and you say, you know, I think I need to receive Jesus. Because you cannot have the person of the Holy Spirit without the person of Jesus in your heart. I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And if you're there with me, you're going to have to pray and repeat these words with me. If you feel it, just pray with me right now. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died and rose again for my sin. Tonight, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I'm born again. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 41 466 4291 or email us at fenero at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest.